afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really happy to have such an introduction before me. That was great. And I'm going to talk to you about why I'm a fan of Australia and what Julia Gillard, the Boat People, and I have in common. I came first to this country five years ago to do the Australian part of my PhD. I think at the time, I didn't even know where Sydney really was. And now I'm teaching Australian politics and a bunch of other topics at this very university. In fact, Jared, the co-organizer of, of TEDx, is one of my former students. Paul, who is a mentor of TEDx, is also one of my former students. This is great. It makes me feel a little old, but really, this is fantastic. <laughs> and what I really like about this country is, despite my French background, none of my Australian politics students ever said that I wasn't an appropriate teacher for Australian politics. And none of my students of any of my courses ever said that I was um, that they had trouble with my accent. In fact, one student even said that that was the only thing that they liked in my class, that was my French accent. <laughs> so, really, I generally uh, embrace the fact that the Austrians look at the bright side, a very open-minded country and a very attractive country in which you can seize a lot of opportunities. In fact, if Australia has been less attractive, well, basically, your prime minister and opposition leader would have never ended up here. Well, yeah, what, have you, what did I just say? What did I just say? Well, I said that, yes, Julia Gillard, Australian prime minister, and Tony Abbott, opposition leader, just like me, were born here. And I'm very proud to share, that with that, to share that with them, because it shows what migrants can achieve in this country. Now, for a minute, let's just look, have a look at Julia Gillard's personal history. Julia Gillard came to this country when she was four from the cold Wales. She came here with her parents because uh, the Gillard's doctor had recommended a warmer climate for their youngest daughter, who was a chick, sick child. The Gillard didn't know anyone in Australia, but they thought they can offer a better opportunity to Julia by taking her to Australia. So, they took the long journey on a boat to come to Australia and offer her these opportunities. And really, the, she seized these opportunities. Her parents never went to university, and Julia Gillard went on to complete a double degree in arts and, and law. And then she became a respected lawyer, and then the first female prime minister of this country. So really, I think this is a great achievement for a boat people, boat person. <laughs> what, what, what did I just say? Did I just say that Julia Gillard was a boat person, that she was belonging to the boat people? Well, perhaps this is a bit of a stretch. I mean, this is the sort of boat we associate with boat people, right? But on the other hand, generations of Australia have come by boat to this country. So I'm going to show you that, in fact, this isn't such a bit of a stretch to think of the common points between Gila Gillard and the boat people. But first, let's just focus on the contemporary debate on boat people. We don't necessarily think of the common things between Gila Gillard and the boat people in this debate. In this debate, what we think about are two main things. A sense of national crisis is what we see in this debate, and a sense that the boat people are not like us. Now, I'm going to show you that there's no national crisis, and that the boat people, in fact, are very much like us. So, regarding the national crisis, each and every time a boat people's boat enters Australia's maritime borders, you know that's the borders you don't even see on maps, so, each and every time a boat people's boat is entering Australia's maritime borders, you have a sense of national emergency. Politicians give immediate doorstop interviews, and you've got media headlines such as, them again, they are threatening our border protection. More of them, where are we going to put them? Because detention centers are already full. A sense of national crisis. In fact, we should perhaps look at the bigger picture here. Even if the number of asylum claims in Australia made by both people has increased over the previous years, still they aren't the majority. This is the number of asylum claims in Australia last financial year, and as you can see, the proportion of both people is just 45%, while plane arrivals, which we don't call plane people, but <laughs> that's 55%. Now, and if we look at the proportion of asylum claims that are made in this country compared to all asylum claims that are made in the rest of the world, we see that Australia is just 2.6% of all asylum claims, and the rest of the world, 
So perhaps this is putting the Australian experience in context. Another thing that specifically puts the both people experience in context is this slide. This is the amount of people entering Australia's borders every day in 2011. This is about 38,000 people a day. Okay? And of these 38,000 people a day, so on average, both people represent 0.032% of the people who enter Australia's border per day. Everyone else, migrants, tourists, etc., it's 99.968%. I don't think this shows us a national crisis. Because you could also argue that newspapers could just put at the front of their headline, 38,000 more people in Australia today. This is awful. What are we going to do? More French academics. We don't want them here. <laughs> you know, this is not a national crisis. What this is, is a humanitarian crisis. It's a humanitarian crisis for both people because both people die at seas, and when they don't die at seas, they are put into detention centers in which they languish for years. There are solutions to this humanitarian crisis. Practical solution. The first is offering alternatives to both people so that they don't have to risk their life on leaky boats and making the risky journey to Australia. And Australia has done it in the past. The first big experience with this was the Indo-Chinese uh, refugee crisis where Australia increased uh, the passage of refugee, increased the number of refugee visas uh, to come to Australia, and this reduced the number of people who took their boat to come to Australia. So it works. We should, however, remember that refugee visas are not here to stop the boats. They are here to offer protection to people who flee unimaginable trouble, persecution and torture. Still, we know that this can work. How can we solve the detention centers crisis? My solution is very simple. No detention centers, no crisis. Australia is a country in which immigrants are used to seize opportunities. It has shown it in the past. There is no reason why it shouldn't be able to do so. This is the solution to the humanitarian crisis. And I have shown you that there is no national crisis. Now, I'd like to talk to you about the fact that refugees are very much like us. There is a very good report that has been released on this issue recently. It hasn't gotten much media coverage, but it is the most comprehensive report on the issue by Professor Graham Hugo and his team of researchers from the University of Adelaide, what he was doing with his researchers was looking at the achievements in terms of the social, economic, and civic contribution of refugees, including both people, asylum seekers, in this country. And what Graham Hugo's team is saying is that the achievements of refugees over a number of years are very encouraging. Despite the fact that they come as the poorest group of migrants to this country, very rapidly, like other migrants, they are what we call upwardly mobile. That means that they achieve a socioeconomic status quite quickly, which is in many, many cases very close to the status of people who were born in Australia. It's a fantastic achievement. And because I'm a political scientist, I would like to focus on the example of one particular refugee, actually one particular boat people and his, in his uh, way of life. So this um, man is Hugh Van Le. Hugh Van Le came as one of the first boat people, or what we call today boat peoples, to Australia in 1977 in Darwin. He was fleeing the crisis in Vietnam. So he came to this country about 30 years ago, a bit more than that. And 30 years later, he was named the Lieutenant Governor of South Australia. Now, what does the Lieutenant Governor do? That, that's my job to answer that sort of question. I'm a political scientist. So what this means is that in case the Governor of South Australia can't do his job, he's representing the Queen in South Australia. He's the first Vietnamese refugee to have such a position in the world. So this is what you can achieve as a boat person in Australia. So I think really this is a very inspiring example of what you can achieve with a policy that offers more opportunities to refugees. So if you believe that these are ideas worth spreading, that this is a sort of policy that Australia should pursue, there are a number of things that we can do together. First, it is important to put things in Australia in global context and to look at the bigger picture. 
to remind us that there's no national crisis, that there's a humanitarian crisis to which there are solutions. And second, and even perhaps more important, Lee Wynn should remember that refugees are very much like us, that they live in our communities, have the same aspirations as all of us, and engage with them in our communities. This is critical, I think, to a better refugee policy in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you.